that to go. Um, so yeah, my, my name is Kerstin Lenk. Um, and uh, just that you know, uh, we are recording uh, this event, uh, that uh, you're aware of this. Uh, I'm, I hope that you got a notification. And uh, we're super excited uh, like that we got this workshop actually together. So we have like some amazing experimentalists here, but also from the modeling side. And uh, what we would like uh, to actually gain in this uh, two days is uh, like an exchange uh, between modelers and experimentalists. And uh, as you can see, we have like an amazing uh, lineup. And uh, what I would like to do is, uh, I first would like to thank uh, the organizers uh, of the CNS uh, that they have selected our workshop. And uh, the second uh, what, uh, thing I would like is uh, to thank actually the co-organizers. Without uh, them, it wouldn't have been happen uh, to organize this event. And uh, this is uh, the schedule for the next uh, two days. Um, so we have uh, three slots. And uh, in each slot, we have uh, two speakers. There's a, um, like a short discussion after each um, um, uh, talk of uh, like five minutes, roughly two to three questions. And uh, then we would really like to foster a joint uh, discussion of the end of each uh, uh, slot. So uh, we would really also ask you, if you ask questions, also ask them for the two of, the, uh, of them so that uh, we can uh, like get into uh, like discussion as said. Uh, just some housekeeping, uh, please. Um, Keep uh, your uh, videos off them during the talk, just uh, the speaker has it on basically. And uh, if you have uh, questions, there's two ways. Uh, one is you, you post uh, your um, question directly in the chat here in Zoom, or uh, you just uh, put the word question in to the chat and uh, then in the question in the discussion around uh, we will uh, call your name and then you can speak uh, your question out loudly and uh, to that we can track a little bit to whom uh, the question is meant uh, just put like a handle like at or a hash uh, in front of the speaker's name or just uh, write both of them if it's uh, meant for the joint uh, discussion and uh, in the joint discussion we will really try to pick up uh, those questions meant uh, for both and uh, here's a again uh, the link uh, for the website. So if you want uh, to check the ch schedule uh, for the next two days. And uh, we also have uh, some channels on Discord, uh, which are for more like chats in between uh, and then for not answered questions. So we will uh, post all questions there. And then also the speakers uh, are asked uh, to actually maybe answer to the uh, questions that have not been addressed uh, during the discussion times. This is, I don't know if you have seen, but uh, this is how Discord uh, looks like. So we will also provide you the links uh, to the guidelines. And uh, there are basically, there's a channel, um, uh, channel which you can maybe use uh, for this uh, channel chats. Uh, so if you just want to say hi, and then there is for each slot, so two speakers, there's one uh, channel. So we will put uh, the questions in there so that it's not like getting totally messy. So if you have uh, like a specific figure you want to follow up, just find uh, the slot for that. They are named as in the CNS uh, website. And uh, then there's also this audio um, channel at the end. Uh, so if you want to speak with somebody specifically, uh, you can also uh, turn on uh, the audio um, there. And uh, by that, I think we are ready to go. And uh, we are happy to have uh, like the first uh, speaker here, which is Yukiko uh, Goda from uh, the Riken in uh, Japan. And uh, she will uh, speak about uh, astrocyte NMDA receptors regulate the range of basal synaptic strength of hi uh, hippocampal neurons. So we, the stage is yours. Okay. Um, could everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And um, I'd very much like to thank the organizers for um, inviting me. Um, it's really a special opportunity um, because um, I normally speak mostly to experimentalists and um, I think it's a very special audience. So um, thanks again. And we are actually a Synapse people. So my lab has been interested in um, synapses. And I move right in. And in particular, we've been interested in understanding how um, synaptic strength with two key parameters, um, the, the presynaptic um, release probability 
and the number of functional postsynaptic receptors are set at individual synapses and then dynamically modified um, during different forms of synaptic plasticity, and especially um, in relationship to um, other nearby synapses forming the local circuit. And we've been interested in this problem because, um, first of all, pre- and postsynaptic strengths are highly heterogeneous. So even though synapses belonging to the same um, axon or same dendrite, are, they're quite um, diverse. And why do we care about heterogeneity of synaptic strengths? Um, and also how they might be positioned or placed along the dendritic tree, for instance. And it's thought to boost the computational power and storage capacity of the network. And also, I don't address so much in today's talk, but um, we're also very keen in understanding um, the way in which the, the, the synapses of particular spent, uh, strengths are positioned um, along the dendritic tree, which um, is um, crucial for the input-output relationship, non-linearities of um, dendritic integration. And um, it impacts how dendrite might process information during learning, for instance. So today's talk, oh, before that, I'm getting a little bit ahead, but um, the, the synaptic strength distribution shows this um, log um, or skewed Gaussian um, log normal distribution. Um, this is the hippocampal um, CA1 uh, Schaefer collateral input coming from CA3 um, neurons, which is um, what we study. And it shows this very broad uh, distribution of synaptic strengths. If you look at individual presynaptic boutons, the release probabilities are also um, broadly distributed. And also, same is true for postsynaptic strength, in this case, estimated by the spine head volume, uh, which correlates nicely with a number of functional AMP receptors. Okay. So, um, so we've been interested in understanding, are there any mechanisms that control the overall shape of the synaptic strength distribution across the synapse population? And in particular, especially for those synapses that belong to the same input type. So, in this case, today's instance, it's going to be the Schaefer collateral input CA3 to CA1 synopsis. And in particular, for example, what sets the upper limit? What sets the lower limit? And how is the average or median value set? Um, so it's, it's those questions um, that we've been keen. And um, so today's talk is also concerns the presynaptic parameter, the release probability, which has been much more difficult to access uh, compared to um, postsynaptic strength, which is quite uh, visible in terms of the spine head volume. Okay, so the key um, player turns out to be astrocytes, which is why I'm here. And for this audience, I don't really need um, um, any uh, introduction, except to say that it's only past 10, 20 years that the role for astrocytes in actively regulating um, synaptic transmission has been acknowledged. And this is through these um, very fine uh, processes of astrocytes um, that are very sponge-like and um, that in, has really um, intimate connection with um, individual synapses. But also um, astrocytes through gap junctions can form a sensation to regulate um, or, you know, to, 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 to regulate synapses in a more macroscopic fashion as well. Okay. And here is um, labeling of astrocytes in the hippocampal section, um, M cherry, the, 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 the red um, signal, <clears throat> as the astrocyte nuclei, and you can see that they're tiling the entire um, <clears throat> uh, hippocampus quite nicely. Uh, the one figure on the right, um, it's the same one, but it's also showing the astrocyte cytoskeleton, GFAP, that's stained in green as well. And you can see that there's quite dense. So there's just really numerous um, <clears throat> uh, number of um, <laughs> astrocyte population. Okay. So then several years ago, we wanted to ask, well, how might be the, um, the overall you know, presynaptic strength distribution regulated and perhaps astrocyte might be really nicely situated to do this. 
And so Mathieu Letelier, who was a um, uh, postdoc in my lab in the past, and we've um, had some very fruitful collaboration since. So um, he patched onto a CA1 pyramidal cells, and then he sampled two separate uh, synaptic strings, two separate population of synapses that are forming connections onto a given C1 neuron from which the recordings have been made. And to, in order to assess presynaptic strength, um, we use this quite often use a measure, uh, paired pulse ratio, which is inversely related to release probability, um, just very quickly. So if the input strength is really high at large EPSC amplitude, then immediately um, subsequent to the first stimulation, then the response might be smaller, and vice versa, if it's release probability is weak, then you have a larger um, paired pulse ratio. So when we sample paired pulse ratio between these two independent inputs, um, these are both Schaeffer collaterals coming from CA3, then we find that uh, the PPRs are quite um, scattered. So this is consistent with heterogeneous release probabilities. But then what Mathieu did was to then uh, patch onto a nearby astrocyte, and he put in an Alexa dye, and because of the gap junctional coupling, you see the spread of the, the red Alexa dye um, making this halo um, through um, revealing this um, gap junctionally coupled astrocyte sensation. And along with this Alexa dye, he also put in BAPTA calcium chelator, upon which um, correlation emerged. So it seems um, calcium signaling is normally playing a role to make these uh, presynaptic strengths as different as much as possible. Also, when he put in QX314 or D890 into this astrocyte patch pipette, correlation emerged. QX314 is a um, uh, voltage um, sensitive sodium channel blocker, but it also it's known to block voltage-gated calcium channels. D890 is a verapamil homolog. It blocks L-type voltage-gated calcium channels. So um, this is consistent with the um, calcium signaling being involved. What was a bit surprising to us is that when he put an MK to 1, which is the NMD receptor antagonist, um, into this astrocyte patch pipette, this also seemed to um, reduce the uh, heterogeneity, so the correlation emerged, suggesting that NMD receptors and NMD receptors present in astrocytes, as well as voltage-gated calcium channels and calcium signaling, seems to be playing a role in maintaining um, this diverse presynaptic strengths of these um, Schaefer collateral inputs. So after the, um, this subsequently, Pete Chipman, uh, a new postdoc in the lab, when he joined, he wanted to um, continue on this project, but um, he wanted to make the assay a little bit simpler by simply using one stimulating electrode, although the experiment became more um, difficult in a way, it's more um, time consuming. Um, but he devised a very simple pharmacological assay whereby he patched onto these CU1 pyramidal cells by including MK01 inside the patch pipe, but so to block postsynaptic NMD receptors, where NMD receptors are highly abundant. And then, um, while well, monitoring impaired pulse responses, um, he made sure that the synaptic and uh, postsynaptic NMD receptors are, are blocked. And then, um, bath applied NMD receptor antagonist and compared before and after bath application for many, many cells, um, looking at the paired pulse ratio distribution. And um, so, in this case, the uh, extracellularly bath applied NMD receptor antagonists could act on presynaptic NMD receptors, perhaps, or astrocyte NMD receptors. And what Pete found was that compared to um, control vehicle baseline versus vehicle application, where you don't see so much of a difference in the PPR distribution, upon applying either MK to 1 or AP5, there was um, narrowing of this PPR pair pulse ratio um, distribution. And both the weaker um, sort of uh, release probably synopsis and the strong ones seem to um, be affected most, but without so much an effect on this average value, which was um, interesting. Pete also measured EPSC amplitude, and there's no change 
course, in control. And in Cato 1, there's a little bit of an increase. With the AP5, there is a significant increase that we saw. But we think that this is due to an additional effect of NMD receptor antagonist on postsynaptic side, whereas the PPR is measuring affecting the presynaptic side. So then, um, since our previous uh, results suggested astrocyte NMD receptor involvement, and not knowing which NMD receptor subtype in astrocytes might be, um, be playing a role, uh, we made use of um, GRIN1, uh, flux mice. GRIN1 encodes the obligatory um, GUN1 NMD receptor subunit, which is important for forming a functional NMD receptors. And then we knocked down specifically in astrocytes by using um, Cree virus, which is driven by the astrocyte-specific GFAT promoter, either the Cree virus or a control virus in which um, it's containing the exact same sequences except for um, no pre-recombinase so that you don't get an um, astrocyte knockdown. And you can get pretty specific um, expression of this construct in GFAT positive um, astrocytes as shown here. And then um, he prepared uh, acute hippocampal slices. And by the way, I didn't mention all the experiments that I'm showing you are done in the adult um, mice, um, two to three month old. Uh, hippocampal slices. Okay. And compared to, so this is a control um, uh, virus injected animal. So, like before, compared to baseline, AP5 application um, narrows the PPR distribution, whereas in pre injected mice where astrocyte and MDA receptors are presumably knocked down, the um, PPR distribution is slightly narrowed to begin with. And this narrowing seems to occlude the subsequent um, AP5-dependent narrowing, which is you see in control conditions. But um, if you knock down uh, with CRE, you don't see this. So this suggests that this um, effect of PPR modulation is due to um, astrocyte NMDA receptors. So then um, what might be the consequence of this on synaptic plasticity? Is, it, is there some effect? Um, and sorry, this is just one more piece of data. We also looked at the EPSC amplitude. And um, as I showed before, AP5 does show a slight increase, but it was gratifying that upon queen knockdown, uh, we also um, <clears throat> saw that this um, slight increase uh, disappeared as well. Okay. Now, then to look at the um, consequence of this narrowing of release probability distribution, on synaptic plasticity. We uh, talked to Tomoki Fukai, and um, we teamed up with um, Alan Fun um, in Tomoki's lab. And Alan did some modeling experiment for us. And um, so in order to um, model the, the, the presynaptic um, strength distribution, release probability distribution, uh, to simulate control condition versus those narrowed um, condition um, mimicking the NMD receptor blocked um, situation. Um, he got the release probability distribution by um, getting the um, optimal uh, parameters uh, by using the short term plasticity model or modified version of short term plasticity model that was um, originally described by Zodix and colleagues in 1998. And um, for this, he used the experimental data that we generated in our lab um, by Pete. Um, with a 20 hertz repetitive stimulation and just fitting the um, EPSC amplitude to that. And using this um, release probability distribution under control conditions in NMD receptor um, simulated condition, um, Ellen tested several different synaptic plasticity paradigms. And shown here is the STDP, spike time independent plasticity, using synaptically connected leaky integrated fire neurons, 10 synapses. And um, presynaptic um, current injection was fixed. And then uh, the postsynaptic uh, to postsynaptic neuron current was injected of various different amplitude at different timing. And um, as expected, negative um, delta T resulted in LTD, which was not different between control release probability distri distribution versus the NMD receptor narrowed release probability distribution 
But what was different was for LTP, that um, LTP seemed to be compromised with NMD receptor block situation in that uh, a larger current injection was needed to reach LTP compared to control conditions. Um, Alan also um, did a, another version of STDP where um, he used the randomly spiking, um, ran random spike trains, and then compared the same conditions um, or same spike train condition be between the um, control and NMD receptor blocked and found that um, there is a general tendency for depression. So this modeling uh, results is showing that the narrowed presynaptic release probability distribution does seem to compromise um, long-term plasticity. So next, um, we went back to experiments and wanted to know what NMD receptors and astrocytes might be responsible for this, um, apart from the obligatory NMDA in, in our one subunit. And so for this, we turned to um, RT-PCR, and we did um, patch um, RT-PCR. We collected RNA by patch clamping onto astrocytes in the CA1 area, and by doing so, we, we, we also um, collected astrocytes from different um, layers, so stratum radiatum, orients, or stratum lacunosa moleculare. We also collected RNA from pyramidal cells as control, which spikes and by patching, we can make sure that we are indeed collecting RNA from astrocytes because um, astrocytes don't spike, shows linear IV curves, and um, very low uh, lowish resting membrane potential. And when we subject it to known NMD receptor subtypes, then uh, no, no patch is just sticking electrode into the um, slice. And pyramidal neurons expresses uh, GLUN1, GLUN2A, and GLUN2B. Um, as expected, whereas astrocytes across all three layers, SR, SO, SLM, they all um, had high, higher levels of um, gwen 2 c and R2C um, subtype. And this is consistent with what's been reported in um, various number of um, databases. So this was at the RNA level. We also wanted to make sure at the level of protein whether gwen 2 c is expressed in hippocampal astrocytes in the CA1 and unfortunately, antibodies are really not that great for um, NR2C. It's also true for um, NR1, um, incidentally. And so to do this, um, we made, uh, we got a um, uh, Cree mice in which Cree is inserted immediately downstream of the um, uh, GUN2C, um, NR2C um, translational um, initiation. Um, site, and then we crossed this mice to a TD tomato reporter line, and um, looked at the TD tomato expression. And as you can see, we see very nice overlap between TD tomato and GFAP labeling. There are some occasional new and positive um, TD tomato um, cells that we did find, and this is also consistent with um, previous reports of um, GUN2C being expressed in some interneurons, but majority of um, TD tomato is um, expressed in GFAP positive cells as quantified um, here. Okay, so with this then, we wanted to go back and um, test in our release probability or PPR assay to see whether um, it's the GUN2C containing NMB receptors that's responsible for this. And incidentally, we also looked for GUN2D, and uh, we could not detect um, any RNA in our um, RT-PCR and hippocampal extracts. So for this, we used, um, oh, so this is the data that I showed you previously with AP5. We see a narrowing of the PPR distribution, which is occluded in these um, NR1, GUN1 knockdown um, acute slices, or mice obtained, uh, or, or mice in which GUN1 is knocked down. And um, then we did the same experiment, but now using QNZ46, which is the NMD receptor antagonist that's specific for GUN2C or GUN2D containing um, NMD receptors, but not um, finding GUN2D, we could be confident that it's um, targeting, um, the effect that we see is due to targeting GUN2C containing NMD receptors. And indeed, we see a narrowing of the 
PPR distribution and control pre-infected um, mice, but not with um, pre-knockdown shown here. Okay. So then, um, this is uh, just one more series of experiments, and um, we also did a crude experiment to make sure that the um, we, we are getting the um, NMD receptor knocked down. And uh, we, yeah. Uh, just uh, like uh, starting to wrap up, uh, like 20 minutes or some close Oops. hour. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, just that you know. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, yeah. So, so this is just, yeah, just very quickly. So um, we, we, if you pop on NMD glycine, it's a very crude, dirty experiment because we're not blocking neuronal NMD receptors. And um, if you're patching onto astrocytes from SR, SO, or SLM, you see these very slow depolarization. And only in the SR astrocytes do we see um, the dependence on astrocyte NR1 knockdown. And um, whereas we do see responses across all, which is consistent with um, NMD receptors being expressed across all layers. And um, so this suggests that somehow there's something different in SR astrocytes uh, in their signaling and their capacity um, to mediate this NMD receptor dependent responses. And so we wondered whether this could be due to, um, could also be reflected in the ability of this um, you know, PPR regulation, that it might be pathway specific. And so we checked in stratum aureans, and we actually did not see so much um, pronounced effect, um, not in aureans, and also not in stratum lacinosum moleculare, um, and K01, AP5, no difference. Also, um, in the knockdown case, no difference, whereas previously in the SR, we did see a narrowing. So this effect of the ability of the astrocyte NMD receptors and um, going to see containing NMD receptors to modulate presynaptic shrink seems to be layer specific. So here's the summary. So uh, what I showed or what we showed is that the astrocyte NMD receptors increase the heterogeneity of presynaptic strength. Um, by expanding the range, making sure the, the, the top and also the bottom, and um, without significantly altering the average synaptic strength, so they exert a very subtle modulation. This involves astrocyte echo and 2C NMD receptors. We believe this could be the first time revealing a role for um, astrocyte glue and 2C, and um, this displays pathway specificity, so that this suggests that. Um, there's some circuit function for the Schaefer collaterals uh, is much more dependent on the presynaptic strength being more variable than the other um, connections. So um, these are some of the uh, questions that we would like to pursue. And with that, this um, work was done by Pete Chipman, who is the, the main person, and, um, uh, and Alan Fung uh, did the modeling bit that um, I introduced, and um, Ale Pazo did the um, more molecular analysis. Thank you for your attention, and sorry for going over. Thanks a lot uh, for the interesting talk. Uh, we have uh, one uh, question that uh, Sohita would like to ask orally, um, so please uh, go ahead. Hi, Yukiko. Uh, uh, amazing uh, data, really nice stuff, really enjoyed it. A uh, quick question is, uh, so, uh, the heterogeneity seems to somehow positively affect LTP, right? And so do you think it, the depletion of vesicles uh, when the heterogeneity is constrained uh, plays a role in uh, its relationship to LTP? Um, mm -hmm. So I guess uh, in, in short, what about uh, the heter heterogeneity affects LTP? Oh, sorry, I didn't catch the last bit. What about the... Uh, uh, so the spread of release probability and its connection to LTP, is it because of depletion of vesicles, do you think? Yeah, I, so, so that's a great question and um, we, we don't know. I think um, we would like to test it experimentally. Uh, we also think that under, with the experimental conditions, um, LTD could also be affected, depending on you know, the stimulation paradigm that one uses. Um, so 
yeah, we we don't really have an answer. Also, uh, I think the um, you know the there is um an astrocyte NMD receptor dependent signaling component that also affects the postsynaptic side. So when we do these um, measures, we want to uh, really tease apart and just look at the presynaptic part or postsynaptic part um, separately in the context of um, LTP. So which makes uh, the actual experiments a little bit more difficult. Do you do you remember by any chance uh, how did he get the effects in the in the model uh, the effects on LTP? Oh, so you yeah so he he also did tested the BCM model so if you I could um, it would be best if you talk to him directly or um, we have posted on I'll bio art yeah I'll put yeah. yeah great thanks thank you okay thank you very much uh, we continue with uh, Ala. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ala Boris is at, uh, sorry for the pronunciation, I hope uh, I didn't screw up too, too much, uh, is at the University of uh, Utah and uh, she will uh, speak about uh, modeling astrocytes from synaptic cleft to large networks. Please go ahead. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. Okay, thanks, Gerson. Um, okay, first of all, well, thank you very much for organizing this and for inviting me to speak. Um, I am very much looking forward to all your talks and to talking to all of you. Um, I also have to apologize, I have a cold, so if I have to stop for a second to get a sip of water to cough, um, I ask for your patience. Okay, so. Um, this work of modeling astrocytes, um, first of all, everything, all the ideas and, and everything that has been done has been done with the active participation of Greg Handy, who I think is in the audience, who is now a postdoc at the University of Chicago, and he started this work as his PhD work at the University of Utah. So what we're, what caught our attention and what we wanted to think about is uh, so if you think about communication between neurons, um, and then you look at the astrocyte experimental data. So here is a beautiful picture of an astrocyte that wraps around the synapse. <clears throat> and so what we notice in the literature is that um, there's some of the synapses are wrapped or in sheath by astrocytes, and some are not. Um, and the frequency with which this happens. Um, seem to be different in different areas of the brain and also seems to change during some of the diseases, for example, in some forms of epilepsy. So we really wanted, uh, we were wondering um, how, you know, how to think about this, this wrapping of astrocytes. What does it do to neural communication? Why may it be, why may we want to have it different in different brain areas? And also when, it, when there are changes to it in the disease, is it contributing to the disease? Is it part of the problem? Or is it really a protective mechanism? So the, the, this um, kind of brings up a couple of large scale questions. So first of all, you know, in the network, what does it do? How does it, you know, if we include this astrocy astrocytic enchantment, how does it change our understanding of what the um, network does, of the, of the dynamics of the neural network? But also it brings up kind of a more technical uh, challenge question, how to include astrocytes in the neural network. So ideally, you don't want to include like a full-blown, complicated, many components astrocyte model. Neural networks by themselves are fairly complicated, fairly uh, uh, expensive computationally to run. So we definitely don't want to add like full-blown astrocyte models um, to it. So can we figure out some way to include some aspects of, of what astrocyte does? Uh, that captures some important features of what astrocyte need to be doing in this network without including the full model. So some way to include effective astrocytes um, in neural networks. So the way we're approaching this is we're gonna zoom in and we're gonna look at various aspects of what astrocyte does um, to a synapse at this zoomed in kind of fine spatial scale. 
and we will hopefully extract from it some you know bottom line this is what astrocyte does you know if the astrocyte is nearby you know or you know if astrocyte wrapping has different degree of uh tightness or astrocyte protrudes or doesn't protrude into synaptic cleft uh, to a certain extent, this is what the astrocyte is going to do. Um, look at this from the different points of view, all in this zoomed in, fine spatial scale version, find the bottom line in each of the studies, and then include that as part of this effective astrocyte, the modul modulatory role that the astrocyte will have in a neural network. Then we can run the network, then we can see how our understanding of how neural network dynamics is created needs to be adjusted to include this um, astrocytic involvement. Okay, so I'm going to show you um, one in kind of more detail, um, another one more briefly, and the third one I'll just mention, three different zoomed in aspects of astrocyte involvement that we're looking at. <clears throat> okay, so the first one is in which we are only considering astrocyte as restricting synaptic volume. So again, you know, if we think about this picture, this is a synapse, and then the astrocyte is kind of encroaching on the sides of it, you know, in 2D view, but really kind of wrapping all around the three-dimensional structure. And this is, you know, the mathematical way to think about this. Presynaptic cell, postsynaptic cell, postsynaptic receptors, release site, and then it's all wrapped by an astrocyte, which is here, on the sides. And so what I want to ask is, depending on how close in the astrocyte is, where whether or not it um, protrudes into the synaptic cleft, or you know, it's not there, or it's very loosely wrapped, um, how many molecules will breach the postsynaptic receptors as a function of time? So in other words, what the postsynaptic conductance is going to be like. So we studied this model, we called it DIRT model for diffusion with recharging traps um, in a couple of kind of mathy papers um, in collaboration with Sean Lolly, my colleague. And so remember, this is what we want to ask. So astrocyte in this case is nothing else but restricting synaptic, um, synaptic volume. So all it's doing is providing a boundary. And when the molecules of neurotransmitter, you know, think of glutamate diffusing in the synaptic cleft, if they hit the astrocyte, astrocyte is just picking them up, bucking them up. Okay, so that, that's all it's doing is changing the boundary conditions for this diffusion process or restricting the space in which the molecules can diffuse. Okay, uh, for, you know, more mathy people in the audience, we're also, so this is a diffusion process with interesting boundary conditions because these receptors, we consider them as switching boundary. And, you know, I'm not going to talk about more about this in this talk, but we did study it in those couple of papers. Okay, but what we need for this talk is, first of all, remember, so in my title here, we want to figure out, you know, effect of astrocyte wrapping on the communication between neurons eventually, but really what we're doing here is just looking um, the effect on the time course of receptor activation specifically, and the only effect the astrocyte is having here is, is uh, changing the volume in which the molecules, uh, uh, in which the molecules are allowed to diffuse. There's nothing else. Okay. So we can do this uh, with, with different um, levels, as I said, of, of uh, protrusion into synaptic cleft or not. Um, but here I'm only showing two examples. So imagine, you know, psyllis without astrocyte, the wider cleft, or synapse tightly wrapped with astrocyte, the astrocyte really protrudes into the synaptic cleft and make it small. So if I look at the postsynaptic conductance, number of activated receptors on the postsynaptic cell as a function of time, here's what our model is predicting will happen. So the blue line with, without astrocyte, this is kind of the regular synaptic conductance that you think of, but if the astrocyte is there and wrapping the whole thing tightly, what happens is you can notice that the um, time course is much faster, it's falling down faster. The amplitude is nearly the same. So what is really happening here is that um, the synapse becomes faster, but it also becomes weaker because the integral of that whole synaptic conductance, the total conductance that, that will be transferred is smaller with the astrocyte than not. 
So if the synapse is wrapped with an astrocyte, we expect that synapse, if it has the same everything, the same release probability, the same number of receptors, um, you know, the same everything else, other than whether the astrocyte is there, uh, we expect the synapse with an astrocyte to be faster in utero. Okay, so then we're gonna include it in the network model. Just very briefly, this is a network of exponential integrated and fire neurons. They, when they spike, they get reset. And the neurons get input of two types. There's this feed forward, essentially noisy input that they're all getting, um, uh, kind of that they, uh, some of them are getting randomly. And then um, there's the recurrent input, which are the connections within this network. And all I want to emphasize here, I mean, the, this is a fairly standard model. The, the input is summed over nodes that connect to the cell, over all spiking events of those nodes. And then every time a cell spikes, it produces this postsynaptic connectance where it jumps and then decays exponentially. And so it has two parameters, the, the decay time parameter and the strength parameter that has to do with the size of the jump. And so usually that people consider in this networks are two types of synapses, one excitatory, one inhibitory. Sometimes there are a couple of different excitatory and inhibitory ones. Um, and often people consider homogeneous networks. So the strength are pretty much all equal or at least within the same type of synapse. So what the astrocytes will do if they wrap some of the synapses, then those synapses will become uh, effectively of a different type. They will become faster and weaker so they will have different values of those two parameters, tau and w. And so you increase synaptic heterogeneity in the network. So now the question is, how is that gonna affect the dynamics? So I'm just gonna show you two brief examples. One is, this is a network of excitatory and inhibitory cells. The red are excitatory, uh, blue are inhibitory. Uh, they receive some noisy input current and this, is, this network is tuned to be in this asynchronous of balanced state. So then what you do is you add some astrocytes to some percent of the synapses in this network. And you see that the network is pretty much doing a very similar thing, but then all neurons synchronize. So this, this dark red and blue is where the neurons become synchronous. And if you do different realization, this is exactly the same input, which is on top, um, but a different realization of which, um, uh, which synapses are wrapped, which synapses have astrocytes attached to them, and it uh, synchronizes at a different time. So <clears throat> what happens here is that essentially including these astrocytes into consideration makes the network tend to synchronize. So pushes the network towards synchrony, towards the tendency to synchronize. In a different example where dynamics of the original dynamics of the network is different, what we did here is following this 2017 paper, we had a spatial organization in the network where um, each cell in this first feed forward layer connects to some, um, you know, to, to some radius uh, uh, of, of cells in the second layer. And cells in the second recurrent layer also connect within some radius um, of connections. And so what they found before is that if the um, recurrent connections are narrow, then there is small, the spatial correlations are small, but if the recurrent corrections are wide, then there is more of spatial correlation. And um, so this is a network um, of purely neurons. It, I will show you correlations in cells, but you can maybe see that there's kind of less spatial organization on the left than on the right. Um, and so these are the, the, just the neurons. If we now include neurons in either one of these cases, then the spatial correlation is actually increasing. You can see there's more narrow, but very pronounced ensembles of neurons going up and down together. So now what we're looking at here is a 2D sheet of neurons and black is the spikes of those neurons. So here it's summarized in the correlations. Black is, is just the neurons. You can see that adding astrocytes, increasing correlation, this is correlation as a function of distance from the neuron. And in the case where there are 
practically no spatial correlations, um, inclusion of estrocyte um, induces them. So overall, again, in this example, inclusion of estrocyte, consideration of estrocyte, include, uh, increases the tendency to spatial patterns. So overall, for now, just from this part, just considering this one aspect of estrocyte involvement, we're predicting that estrocyte or add a new level of heterogeneity by making individual synapses weaker and faster, that they increase the tendency of synchronous behavior in the networks, either the spatial patterns or just overall synchrony in their end of network. Um, in, you know, in what I alluded to before, for example, in the case of epilepsy, where more synapses are in sheath during the disease, this hints at this enshathement actually contributing to the problem rather than playing a protective role because it increases tendency to synchronize. Um, and then this is kind of a speculation, you know, because it creates this more pronounced spatial ensembles, maybe it can have some consequences for sort of overall coding, um, maybe. Okay, but let's take a quick look at another zoomed in view. So this is again looking uh, zoomed in in detail, but a different aspect of what the astrocyte can do. Okay, so the asset here is the following. Again, you know, we're thinking single synapse, astrocyte nearby. But now we'll remember that there are all these uh, channels and pumps and transporters on the surface of astrocyte. So this is work done by postdoc um, uh, Carter Johnson. And what we want to look at is by involving all these membrane mechanisms, how does uh, astrocyte change extracellular concentration of different ions, which will in turn change reversal potentials for the postsynaptic neuron, which will um, in turn affect the spiking of the postsynaptic neuron. So now this is a different aspect of astrocyte involvement. Now we're saying, Whatever the synaptic input is here, um, once it arrives at the postsynaptic neuron, what will the response of the postsynaptic neuron be? Okay, and so we want to know how astrocyte affects that through this particular pathway of changes in extracellular ion concentrations. So the way Carter is doing this is he is looking into, you know, in a very detailed way into models of these different um, components. He is, so there's just one example for the potassium channel. He's looking at multiple data sets, multiple different models and fitting models to the data sets and then choosing the models. So there's a lot of detailed work going into this. And I don't expect to look at those equations uh, to read all these equations, but the, the bottom line is that's what we're doing. We're, we're doing kind of very detailed modeling of each component and then putting them all together. And I just want to point out here that all these mechanisms are also uh, connect to the um, calcium response in the neuron, you know, because first of all, there's this calcium sodium exchanger. So it will depend on the calcium response in the cell. And so we have a previous model of astrocyte calcium. This is Greg's and Mars's uh, PhD works published several years ago where we had a fairly detailed model with multiple mechanisms of, of calcium handling in the astrocyte. Um, and we um, kind of classified responses to short puffs of agonists into four different classes. Uh, we predicted um, uh, calcium handling mechanisms, how they differ in different parts of the cell based on the distribution of these response types. So it was a fairly detailed work. And the bottom line here, or the, the reason we need it today at all is because we're, we're gonna use it to interface with all these other mechanisms. So I'll just show you one example of what this does um, to the neuron. So let's say what I'm gonna do, um, I'm gonna consider the synapse, but actually there will be no glutamate. Okay, so I just want to consider a situation of increased extracellular potassium. So this is, Pathological situation, think, you know, cortical spread and depression, uh, it, it, extracellular potassium is increased. And we wanna see what the near, what the astrocyte presence or absence, how it's gonna affect the postsynaptic uh, cells response. 
So the, the spiking here is induced by just a step current that's applied at some point. Okay, so normally if you do this to this postsynaptic cell, it's gonna spike with high frequency. If you increase extracellular potassium, it's gonna spike faster. If we include astrocyte, which is both this magenta and, and cyan uh, responses, uh, we can look at the extracellular potassium. It's being removed by the astrocyte back to the normal level. And so notice that the time scale here is really long in seconds uh, from neurons point of view. And so we can do this you know, spiking um, experiment to the neuron at different points um, during this, this astrocyte um, action. So, so think about this. Um, the, the difference between magenta and cyan is that one of them, sorry, um, one of them is with the astrocyte just there, not have any calcium response, but the other one is with a calcium response in astrocyte. And you can see that they're pretty much the same. There's some difference, but it's hard to tell at this scale. But then what's gonna to happen to the spiking of postsynaptic neuron during this, uh, during this time? So if you think about it, it goes from this increased extracellular potassium, which is, you know, this case, faster spiking, to normal extracellular potassium, which is the slower spiking. So in between, it seems like it should just go, you know, different firing rates in between those two. But here is what it actually does. There's no spiking, there's no response. Why? Well, because we have to look at the, at the sodium. So all these mechanisms that we're considering, they, um, uh, the, the concentration of calcium and potassium and sodium are all interconnected. So it's actually a, a potass uh, sorry, a sodium concentration that's having the largest effect. And if we look in this um, plane of having reversal potentials of, of potassium and sodium corresponding to these changes in concentrations. Um, this is the one, this is the baseline case, kind of normal conditions. And the color here is the frequency of spiking. This is the increased potassium concentration, increased frequency of spiking. And when the astrocyte is just there and doesn't have a calcium response, this is the cyan line then indeed the, the spiking just goes from the faster to the slower, kind of just monotonically. But during the, the calcium response of the astrocyte, the sodium changes so much that it brings the system into this area where there's no spiking, where there are no colored dots, the, the cell is not spiking. So it brings it over, over into that region. So what we can learn from this is that Postsynaptic spiking, you know, I can show you just one example, but in general, it can be modulated by a nearby astrocyte via this extracellular ion concentrations. It seems that it changes in extracellular sodium and not potassium that play the largest role. Um, and the spiking changes are non-monotonic. They're actually quite complicated and we're still figuring it out. And just to mention very briefly, just a couple of words, what we're also doing a third zoomed in point of view is we are also refining this calcium response models that we had from receptor to the calcium response. And we're looking at the interplay between um, uh, the receptor desensitization, positive and negative feedbacks from calcium to IP3, how they interact to shape the calcium response. And again, the point of all this is that we are taking these zoomed in points of view. We're you know, refining our understanding of calcium response off interaction between astrocyte and neurons through these extracellular ions and restricting synaptic volume. Um, and um, the, the goal of all this is to, to kind of extract takeaway messages from each of these subparts of the projects and um, to, to do these um, effective astrocyte models in the network. Okay, and finally, thank you to, again, to everybody who has been involved in this project. And thank you everyone for listening. Thank you very much for the presentation, Ala. Are there any questions? 
Uh, please use the chat uh, to uh, to write your questions or to uh, announce that you would like to ask a question. Um, we are monitoring that uh, constantly. Uh, so the first uh, question is coming from Otto Denison. Please unmute yourself. Yes, hello. Thank you, Ella, for this uh, very nice talk and uh, interesting Thank you. results. Can you hear me? Yes. yes mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, I was wondering, um, so in, in the first part of your talk, you were investigating the effects of the um, enchantment of synapses by astrocytes on the network level activity, and I found it super interesting. Um, I was wondering, as um, most recent results, um, especially performed with super resolution microscopy um, in, um, in vivo or in slices, tends to show that there's actually a huge diversity of the distance between the astrocyte and the synapse and not always enchafing. So I was wondering if you investigated the effect of this distance between the synapse and the astrocyte and the activity at the network level yet? Yeah, I did not show this, but this, hold on one second. Um, this result here, um, I only showed two cases, but we actually did it with um, um, using that, that tightness of wrapping, as you say, as a parameter. Mm. And basically, if you look at either the integral, so the total synaptic strength, or you look at the half width, how you know, fast it falls, falls off, um, it basically changes linearly with that parameter. So that the, the, you know, if you have twice, or I guess half the, the size of the synaptic cleft, you know, twice as far protrusion um, of the ash side, you'll have half um, of the strength and um, um, twice the, the, the fall off constant. Interesting. So, um, yeah, so we definitely use that as a parameter. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's also really important to include that diversity to not only include, so in what I showed you, the simple example, the synapses are either in sheathed or not, so tightly wrapped astrocyte or not, but really you need to, to include a distribution of that. And that you know is part of what we're doing. It's it's um, that parameter can be chosen individually for each synapse gamma distribution. Ah, great, thank you. Yep. Uh, the next one is Erin Munro Krul. Uh, do you want to speak up, or um, I can uh, unmute you if you want to speak? Otherwise, I can read your question as you wish. I'll stop sharing for now so that I can see more people. Yeah, just have to get uh, the participants list back. Um, okay. I think Erin wants you to read her question. Yes, okay, I do that. Uh, how does gap junctions uh, connecting the astrocyte affect synchronicity uh, of uh, the neurons? Could uh, they sharpen any uptake of neurotransmitters? Um, yes, um, no, I don't know. Um, uh, we have not, so the only place where we have included um, um, that, the, that effect is uh, that the fact that the astrocytes are connected to each other is in the part with, is in this part, in the extracellular ions part, because the uh, potassium that's picked up by an astrocyte locally can be shuffled, you know, and sent to other places kind of through that, through that network. Um, but everything else that we've done, it was very local. So we're considering, you know, there's just a part, essentially a compartment of an astrocyte around the synapse. And um, that, that's all that we considered. It's very local. So that didn't enter into the picture, except here. Okay, thank you. Um, Jennifer has a question. Do you want to speak up? Yep, um, you can hear me? Yes. So thank you very much for the talk. I found that really interesting, especially the first part when you were talking about the um, neuronal network synchrony and um, thank you. the of the ensembles. So that's really interesting. It's actually really relevant to what I'm gonna talk about next. So um, thanks for the oh, introduction of it. But um, I actually was wondering about that. So do you find that it's a linear relationship between 
presence of astrocytes and the increase in um, synchrony? Is there is it a linear relationship? And at any point, does it um, top out, or is there on the extremes? Is there sort of leveling off? Um, in your mod in your modeling experiment. Yeah, I understand. Um, it must be leveling off. I I don't actually really know. So what we what we did we looked. Hello, am I am I frozen? Or no, uh, I think it's Allah actually. I was just wondering Sorry. about it. Was, it. Uh, um, I think it, she's offered a second. Okay. Uh, I hope she's uh, coming back. I just um, as, as Sohita also put uh, some questions uh, for you, Kiko, uh, on uh, Discord. Do you want to follow up on this? Sohita, are you there? Here, uh, yes. so sh should we then move on to the general discussion with both Allah and Yukiko? Yes, uh, if uh, Allah is coming back, I was just uh, wondering if we bridge the time uh, so that uh, we, uh, until Allah is back, that we ask a question to Yukiko maybe. So does anybody else have questions for Yukiko or should I just uh, go ahead with uh, my burning question? <laughs> <laughs> I think Yukiko might not uh, agree to come for the next meeting I call her. <laughs> uh, Annalisa has a question uh, for Yukiko. Uh, let's take that and then uh, let's uh, go to the break after that. Okay. Go ahead, Annalisa. Okay, thank you. So I want to thank Yuki for a great talk. Uh, I was uh, thinking uh, in terms of uh, the voltage dependence of activation of uh, the 2C two, two, two containing an MDA receptors with respect uh, to the potential to the resting membrane potential of astrocytes. And uh, I, so I'm, I know of these receptors as not being uh, as magnesium sensitive as others, uh, but I'm also aware of the extremely hyperpolarized potential that astrocytes are at. Uh. And so one way to um, sort out this conundrum in my mind uh, was to think about uh, the recent results that Chris Dalla is showing where is actually seen uh, that uh, with uh, bursts of activity, you can uh, locally depolarize uh, the membrane potential of astrocytes by a particularly large amount. It seems to suggest 20 millivolts or so. And so I was wondering whether you were thinking along the same lines uh, and specifically if you see differences uh, in the contribution of the uh, gluant to C receptors to your effects that depends on the frequency of stimulation, because that seems to be a crucial factor for Chris to see his local depolarization. Yeah, thank you. Um, those are great questions. And um, we would like to test different parameters. Um, first of all, regarding the, um, you know, the voltage dependence, uh, we have to find out where they are because um, at the SOMA, of course, they're hyperpolarized, but um, they're very narrow, the, the PAPs, the, the, the astrocyte processes, and so they're, they, they're very compact, and um, I, I, I think they could be depolarized. Um, I, I think um, now the voltage indicators are coming, so so I'm sure there'd be more um, experimental data available with that. But um, even then, so yeah, we, we would like to be able to to know, you know, exactly. Um, so, so so that's the first thing. And um, then uh, in parallel, um, you know, I, I'm very curious to to find out about these um the the, the more the people studying astrocyte. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just getting a little bit slowed down. It's, um, it's like two in the morning, sorry. We really appreciate that, <laughs> that you're taking the time so much. So, um, so are there any uh, joint uh, questions uh, for the both of them? 
So to bring it into uh, connecting both. Yeah, could I ask Ella? Oh, sure. Yes, please go ahead. About this, um, so this is about the first part with the um, you know, the heterogeneity of the sort right. of interaction of the wrapping. Uh -huh. Could you? What happens if you add a time-dependent component? That so not only are they heterogeneous, I think they're quite dynamic in um, withdrawing and touching. If you watch their videos, um, of Valentine's. right. We haven't done that at all. So the way we, um, I mean, but it's a great question. And when we do, Jennifer just asked me if we're planning to combine this first part with wrapping with a second part with the extracellular ion concentrations. Um, the second part is dynamic and we are planning to combine them and that will be time dynamic, but we haven't done that yet. So we are, for now, we're basically considering, you know, we are looking right, they're, acting on very different time scales. So if you consider, you know, right now, you have a certain configuration <clears throat> of astrocyte wrapping, what does it do to the network? And then maybe, you know, the next day, the wrapping will have changed, but, um, but, but we, haven't, we haven't looked at that yet. But, you know, the, the, the overall idea will be the same. The more wrapping and the tighter wrapping you will have, the more kind of synchrony we expect. But it's actually, you know, there's one more thing that I haven't mentioned. It is very possible that these different mechanisms will actually counteract each other to some extent, so that this, um, this uh, involvement of extracellular ion concentrations will actually undo, to some extent, the effect of just restricting the synaptic volume. Um, I, I don't understand that yet very well, how to combine them properly. Thank you. Thanks a lot to the two of you. I think this was a really good uh, kickoff.